What's up you guys, Dr. Gooden back with another strength and conditioning lecture. This time we're talking about plyometrics, programming for plyometrics, as well as the physiology behind them. Dr. Gooden here, back with another lecture. At the bell. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology, and in this video we'll be talking about plyometrics. Specifically, we'll be covering some of the information found in chapter 18 of the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning textbook. Now today we're going to examine the two different models of plyometrics, the neuromuscular model and the mechanical model. Uh, I believe in reverse order though, so let's dive right into the material. Now this info comes from, as I said, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning put out by the NSCA. This chapter was written by David Potak, or Potach, sorry David if I messed your name up, and Donald Chu. And the objective, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna try to explain the physiology of plyometric exercise through those two models that I addressed. We're gonna look at the different phases of the stretch shortening cycle. Then, in follow-up videos, we'll address and identify components of a plyometric training program, and then talk about designing a safe and effective plyometric training program. And in another video, I've actually already covered different types of plyometrics with examples, so you can look at how to scale up or down the plyometrics as far as intensity goes, with points of contact and rate of force development, and the height of the implement or the box that you're jumping on or over, and how to make sure that they are both safe and sport specific. So I'll link to that video as well, uh, but let's continue diving into the physiological and mechanistic underpinnings of plyometrics. Now, the mechanical model of plyometric exercise, this describes the how the musculotendinous components are able to store elastic energy. And they do this during a rapid stretch. So essentially, these elastic components in your muscles, when you stretch them rapidly, they store energy just like a rubber band or a spring does. If you follow this with a concentric muscle action immediately afterwards, then that stored energy is released, increasing the total force production. So it's like free force production. When your muscle con contracts concentrically, it's generating force, but that's not free. It costs you ATP to do so, and it has byproducts of fatigue at the end. But if you store energy, if you capture potential energy, let's say from your body mass falling down to earth due to gravity, and you can store that energy, in the elastic components, giant springs or rubber band-like mechanisms, then you can return that energy upon the subsequent muscular contraction. So the stretch shortening cycle allows us to be not only more efficient, but more forceful and explosive with all of our movements. So here's what it looks like in a mechanical model. We have the series elastic component down here when stretched, this series elastic component stores elastic energy that increases the total force production. And, and anatomically, these are, these are your tendons, right? The tendons that are in series with the muscle fibers themselves. That's why we call it the series elast elastic component. It's in series with the muscle and it's elastic. Next, we have the contractile component right here. Uh, this is the actin and the myosin and the cross bridges between them. This is the primary source of muscle force during concentric muscle action. Then we also have the parallel elastic component. This involves the epimyceum, the paramyceum, the endomyceum, and the sarcolemma. All of these membranes together have a passive um, elastic quality because when they're stretched, they want to return back to their original shape or their original length. So these exert a passive force with unstimulated muscle stretch. So you don't even have to have a rapid stretch, you can just pull them apart and then they'll return back to normal. The tendons require more of a rapid stretch. And then the uh, uh, contractile components themselves, those require an active shortening be, uh, using ATP to generate those cross bridges. So all three of these together contribute to the stretch shortening cycle and the force that you can produce using it. So that was the mechanical model. Mechanistically, how do we account for all of the force that's produced? We account for it in those three ways, the series elastic, the parallel elastic, and the contractile components. We can also explain plyometrics using the neurophysiological model. So this model involves what's called potentiation. Potentiation is a change in the force velocity characteristics of the muscle's contractile components caused by stretch. 
This model involves potentiation of the concentric muscle action by use of the stretch reflex or the myotatic reflex. Now, potentiation is just a fancy way of saying that a previous or a priming action changes or enhances a muscle's force velocity characteristics in a subsequent action. So you can potentiate a vertical jump by first doing, uh, let's say, a, a heavy back squat for a double. Access those high threshold motor units, and that's the priming event, and now those uh, high threshold units will be a little bit easier to activate and call upon when you go and do a max effort vertical jump. In this case, the potentiation is the pre-stretch, that myotatic reflex that we'll see activates the alpha motor neuron to contract the agonist muscle harder during that subsequent action. So here's how it works. When muscle spindles are stimulated, uh, this activates the stretch reflex, which sends action potentials up the 1A fibers back to the dorsal root of the spinal cord, which synapses with the alpha motor neuron in the ventral root. And that sends action potentials back down to the motor units that activate the agonist fibers um, in that muscle. So essentially, this is a feedback loop. The pre-stretch during the absorption phase or the eccentric phase of any stretch shortening cycle movement causes the agonist muscles to contract even harder. So not only do you have the conscious contraction of those muscle fibers, but you also have the subcon subconscious and therefore much faster contraction of those muscle fibers as well. So that's the neurophysiological model of plyometrics. We had, we had both the mechanical, which uh, has to do with more of the, the properties of the tissue itself, and the, neuro, uh, the neuromuscular, uh, which has to do more with the neural qualities and how those muscle fibers are actually activated. Now let's break down the phases of the stretch shortening cycle. The stretch shortening cycle employs both the energy storage of the series elastic component and stimulation of the stretch reflex, which we just talked about, to facilitate a maximal increase in muscle recruitment over a minimal amount of time. And that's really what plyometrics are. They're maximal muscle recruitment in minimal time. So you need to be spending very little time on the ground with very short ground contacts for, for a movement to be considered plyometric. The goal is shorter ground contact time with higher force production. Now, a fast rate of muscular tendinous stretch is vital to muscle recruitment and activity resulting from the stretch shortening cycle. So what that means is if you're about to do a vertical jump and you have a really slow controlled descent, you're not actually going to be tapping into the benefits gained or the elastic storage that you could have or the stretch reflex that you could initiate from your stretch shortening cycle. That um, eccentric phase has to be fast. It has to be a rapid stretch. So here in table 18.1 from the text, we have a breakdown of the three phases. The eccentric phase, this is where the agonist muscle stretches and elastic energy is stored. In the amortization phase, this is between the eccentric and the concentric phase. Uh, it's kind of like a pause between that eccentric and concentric. Uh, the longer the amortization phase, typically uh, the weaker the athlete is or the higher the intensity is of the plyometric. For instance, let's say you had two athletes uh, of the same body mass, one could, let's say, back squat three times their body weight. The other one could back squat half of their body, their body weight as a 1RM. Both of them go to do a vertical jump. Well, on the breaking phase of that vertical jump, the one who's really weak most likely will have a longer amortization phase as they are struggling to really reverse their, uh, their center of mass in the opposite direction. Whereas the person who's really strong, they can probably go down and up really quick, especially if they have a well-developed stretch shortening cycle as well as all of that strength. Then finally, we have the concentric phase. This is when we have shortening of the agonist muscle fibers and the elastic energy is released from the series elastic component. So those are the three phases of the stretch shortening cycle, eccentric, amortization, and concentric. Here's what it looks like with what I think is a very poor diagram of a long jump. The reason it's poor is not because of what's happening here in the air, but what's happening right here when an athlete hits the board or hits their last step in a jump, they never hit or they shouldn't ever hit toes first. Because in order to jump high, you actually have to be breaking and get your center of mass low so that you can almost like pogo stick off your front leg. It's like a mini pole vault, like using your front leg as a pole vault. If you ever watch a pole vaulter, they have to hit that 
pull at an angle into the ground. They can't just hit it straight up. Anyways, I don't really like this diagram, but it is what it is. Just imagine that this heel is actually hitting the ground first. So the three phases. In A, that's right here, we have the eccentric phase, which begins with the touchdown of the foot. Then we have the amortization phase right in the middle, that pause between phase one and phase three. And then the concentric phase, where you have the actual contraction, the shortening of the agonist muscle fibers and the release of the uh, stored energy. Now the key point here is that the stretch shortening cycle combines both the mechanical and neurophysiological mechanisms and is the basis of plyometric exercise. A rapid eccentric muscle action stimulates the stretch reflex and storage of elastic energy. And it has to be rapid, it can't be slow. Uh, which this then increases the force produced during the subsequent concentric action. So we have multiple factors in play which aid the force production and the rapidity of that force production during the subsequent concentric action. And this is why it's so important to not only um, utilize the stretch shortening cycle in our sporting events, but also to train it and to hone it using plyometric activities. So now that you understand a little bit about how the stretch shortening cycle works, the different phases of it, and the two different models that explain plyometric training, in the next video, we're gonna talk about how to incorporate plyometric exercises into your strength and conditioning programs. How do we do it in a safe and effective way for different types of athletes? And then don't forget to check out the video I've already posted showing you some examples of different types of plyos that you can incorporate into your training program with videos of me trying to do them <laughs> at my home in my garage. Don't forget to check out the other videos in my strength and conditioning series that specifically help you prepare for the CSCS test, but also level up your knowledge as an educated strength and conditioning or sport coach. It's always great to be with you guys and I'll see you guys on the next video. So those are the three phases of the stretch shortening cycle, concentric, amortization phase, and the eccentric. Oh, uh, that was backwards.